Uh, hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the public lecture uh, this afternoon, organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or IMS as we call it. Um, my name is Chong Chi Tat, I'm the director of the Institute. We are very happy this afternoon to have uh, a distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Dennis Hirschfeld from the uh, University of Chicago to give the public lecture. This uh, public lecture is uh, generously supported or funded by the Incombeng Memorial Fund. And uh, the fund is used to um, support activities at the IMS, uh, including the public lecture as well as our summer schools uh, and summer and winter schools held at, at, at the Institute. So, uh, Professor Hersfeld received his PhD from uh, Cornell University and except for a brief period as a postdoc in New Zealand has been at the University of Chicago um, for many years. <laughs> right. And uh, he's one of the world's uh, leading uh, figures in the field of uh, computability theory or recursion theory as we call it and uh, has, is also a, a great expositor of, of technical uh, mathematics uh, as evidenced by the award of Shenfield Prize twice um, for, for uh, exposition, uh, outstanding exposition uh, in, of mathematics. Uh, the award was given by the Associate, Association for Symbolic Logic. So uh, he's also very uh, well known for uh, writing jointly with Rod Downley the 800-page the uh, book on algorithmic uh, randomness. And uh, if you have time, you, in fact, if you're interested, you should get a copy. It's heavy, uh, I should tell you that. So um, this afternoon, uh, <coughs> Professor Hesfield will, will give a talk. The title is uh, Waking Up from Leibniz's Dream, The uh, Unmechanizability of uh, Truth. Truth, as we know, uh, has been constant quest of, of, of uh, in human civilization, especially so in these days, the age of what's called fake news. So Professor Hesfeld will tell us something about truth this afternoon. Please uh, welcome Professor Hesfeld. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's always a great pleasure to be here in Singapore, and a particular honor to give this lecture uh, in um, the hospitality of the IMS and uh, Chita Chang in particular is always um, really overwhelming. Um, so the quote that I have here is from 2001 and Hal uh, is the sentient computer in 2001 who goes <laughs> a little bit crazy, looks like that and menacing. Uh, but this is a talk in part about what computers can't do and that's, that's why it's there. The field that I work in, computability theory, is a relatively young field, uh, as fields of mathematics goes, maybe 80 years or so, but it does have some deep roots and I want to talk about some of those uh, today. The, one of the central figures in this story and in general in the story of computability theory and in the intellectual history uh, of the 20th century, really, uh, this doesn't seem to be working, ah, there we go, uh, is Alan Turing. Uh, I'm going to talk about one aspect of, of his work, some people may have heard of him, there was a recent movie about him, there was a lot of activities in his centennial a few years ago, but he was also uh, extremely influential in areas like uh, artificial intelligence and American analysis, mathematical biology, as well as in the construction of early computers, um, and very famously in cryptography during World War II uh, in his work, breaking uh, the um, German codes at Bletchley Park in the UK. He died uh, very young, he could have done a lot more, he was, <laughs> few years younger than I am now when he died. Um, he was gay and the British government persecuted him, essentially tortured him for that and by all accounts drove him to suicide, which of course is something that shouldn't happen to anyone completely regardless of their statu stature as, as a great thinker or um, a war hero. So um, in Turing's honor, I'd like to dedicate this talk to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer community of Singapore with love and respect. So, um, <coughs> Let's begin the story in the 18th century with Jonathan Swift. So Jonathan Swift, the great Irish satirist, um, 
most famous for Gulliver's Travels. And in Gulliver's Travels, he pretty much turned his wit to everything and everybody, and made fun of everything uh, in wonderful ways. One of the lesser known episodes um, in the books, but one that's particularly dear to my heart, is his visit to the Grand Academy of Legado, so known as the Academy of Projectors. Projectors there being meaning people who do projects. Uh, and this was an academy that was set up by the king of the land uh, for the betterment of the people, for you know, great minds to come up with these great things. But of course he was academics, and <laughs> the kind of things that they were doing were things like ex trying to extract sunbeams out of cucumbers and trying to melt ice into gunpowder. And my favorite one, which is to teach mathematics to people by writing propositions on wafers and feeding them to students. And that's how they're supposed to learn math. So these were not the most practical people. And so, of course, this was Gulliver making fun of people like me, right, of academics, and particularly more theoretical sort of academics. And one of the things that he finds there is this writing machine. So this is just a bunch of, these are just a bunch of symbols written in little boxes. These things at the edge here are cranks. You turn them. So this was a mechanical machine, and the idea is that this was a machine for writing books on mathematics, on science, on art, on philosophy, and so forth, <laughs> without actually having to know anything about these subjects. It was a machine for sort of automatically producing knowledge. And what he's told there is that, look, you know, <laughs> all we have to do here is to get some people to turn these cranks and, and these books come out. And, and this is the quote, part of the quote. It says, everyone knew how laborious it was, how laborious the usual method is of attaining to arts and sciences. Whereas by his contrivance, the most ignorant person at a reasonable charge and with a little bodily labor may write books in philosophy, poetry, politics, law, mathematics, and theology without the least assistance from genius or study. So that's kind of a funny idea. But Swift was not gratuitously funny. When he was being funny, he was usually making fun of someone and of something, right? So what was he making fun of? Let's go back a little further to another kind of interesting figure of the 13th and 14th century, Raymond Lull. Uh, lesser known, but he, uh, he was born in the island of Mallorca, which is currently in Spain. He was, like people, uh, many people at that time, he wore many hats, including floppy ones, but he was, a, um, he was a philosopher, a logician, a theologian, a writer, a missionary, etc., etc. Uh, in 1263, he had a series of visions that led him to a religious conversion, and after that, uh, his life project was to convert people to Christianity, in particular to convert Muslims to Christianity. Uh, he went about, he did go on missions to do that, and one of them, uh, he was stoned by people who did not appreciate what he was doing and ended up dying out of that. But the thing that he was best known in this connection was for um, a project to convert people through logic and reason. And his idea was, Look, people who are in this process are going to have lots of questions about the nature of God and the relationship between God and, and, and people and so forth. But there's only a few basic truths. That was his reasoning. And we should be able to combine these basic truths into answers to all of these questions. So he wrote this book called The Ars Generalis Ultima. It's a very modest name. It's called The Ultimate General Art. Uh, and in this book, that book has a lot of like charts and graphs and things. And if you want to know an answer to a question about God and about theology, <laughs> you consult the right chart and match this up with page 33. Go look at this, and your answer just comes out there. In later editions, in later life, he even mechanized that. So this thing over here is a Lullian circle. It's hard to tell from the picture, but these, this is moving parts. These like little bits here actually like rotate and so forth. And there's all things, kind of things, attributes of God and so forth written there. <laughs> and again, if you want answers to your questions, you kind of set the thing up in the right way and you read the question up. So this was a mechanical way of generating truth. And this is where uh, this fits into the story that I want to tell. Now, this is not an idea that, that, that necessarily started with Lowell. Um, there's been uh, some suggestion that in his travels, for example, he encountered a device known as a zarja, which was a device that was used by medieval Arab astrologers to generate ideas by mechanical means. There's also things in the Jewish tradition and so forth. So these things, these ideas would go back. But he put it in a form that ended up being quite influential on a lot of people. Uh, this idea of <coughs> Maybe there's a mechanical way. Maybe we can formalize our questions uh, about, well, theology, but then also maybe science and, and maybe mathematics and philosophy and so forth, and somehow mechanically generate answers so that we don't really need to know anything. We just need to consult the right, the right thing. 
And one of the people that he influenced was Gottfried Leibniz. He also influenced lots of people in England, in the uh, Royal Society of London, and that's probably what Gulliver was making fun of in particular, were the people in the Royal Society who were Lullians in the sense that they thought you know, this was a feasible idea to generate truth mechanically. Leibniz uh, was a, a great philosopher, a great mathematician, um, <coughs> co-inventor of the calculus, um, so you know, he's, He's the one to blame if you take a calculus class that you don't enjoy very much. Or, you know, uh, but he and Newton were co-inventors of calculus. Um, he was also a builder of calculating machines. He built uh, the, the, what's known as a step reckoner. Uh, so I guess he invented in the 1672 and it got completed in 1694. And this is actually a mechanical calculating device. So he was very much into this idea of calculation by mechanical means. And he had this thought that a lot of the problems that we have when we're talking about, say, philosophy, is that we work in human languages, right? We, 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 we're speaking English or German or, or Latin, which is the <laughs> scientific language of the time. But those are imprecise languages, right? I use a word, I mean something slightly different than what you use, you know. Uh, and our reasoning is not necessarily following precise rules. <laughs> and that that's what was causing all this problem, right? Where we had all these philosophical disagreements and so forth. So his idea was, look, what should we do? We should, first of all, develop a language that is well suited for precise argument. So this thing that he called the characteristic universalis, or conceptual language. So the idea would be that this would be a language where um, concepts, scientific concepts, philosophical concepts, and so forth, would be matched to symbols in a precise way. <laughs> so that <laughs> they'd be somehow independent of the actual person using the language, what, what they meant. And then once you do that, then you should develop a framework for logical calculation, a calculus retiocinator. You should figure out what are the laws of valid reasoning and apply them to this language so that everything is done precisely and everything is done in a possibly mechanical way. And then he said, well, if we do that, look, let's think about, for example, accountants doing the books of a company, right? If you have two accountants doing the books of the same company, they have the same numbers. They do the accounting. One of them says, oh, you made $10,000 profit. And the other one says, you have a $20,000 loss. One of them made a mistake, right? And what we do in that situation, we don't, the two of them don't start arguing, right? I mean, hopefully, what you actually start do is you sit down with the two sets of figures and try to figure out where the mistake is. And if you can't figure out, you bring in the third person, right? But you don't, <coughs> because there's a very precise procedure there, and somebody is messing it up. So his idea, Leibniz's idea, Leibniz's dream was that all of, of reason, all of philosophy, all of metaphysics, all of science could be done in a similar way. And here's a quote from one of his, uh, it's an undated note that was in his collection, Notes and Analysis. Uh, he says, once this has been achieved, the development of this universal, this conceptual language and this framework for logic calculation, <coughs> once this has been achieved, when controversies arise, there will be no more need for disputation between two philosophers than there would be between two accountants. <coughs> It'd be enough for them to pick up their pens and sit at their abacuses and say to each other, perhaps I mean some a mutual friend, let us calculate. So either by humans calculating or maybe by a machine helping them, you would be able to actually settle all of the truths of philosophy and science and so on. So what happened to Leibniz's dream? Well, in general, I think that <coughs> it kind of fell out of favor, right? This, this current of thought that this might be a real possibility for philosophy, say, just kind of drifted away. I think people stopped thinking of that as a real possibility. And indeed, in general, even the feeling that there had existed at some point that scientific, precise scientific questions should have precise answers, should be answerable, at least in principle, even that, by the time you reach the 19th century, you're starting to get some doubts about that. So you have a figure here like Emile de bois raymond so de bois raymond was a German uh, physician and physiologist. He, he made some important contributions to medicine. Uh, and then towards the later part of his life, he started getting interested in the philosophy of science. Uh, by the 1870s, uh, he had already published a, a, a paper called On the Limits of Our Understanding of Nature. And in 1880, he gave this address to the Berlin Academy of Science about his seven world riddles. <laughs> and what this was about was, seven <laughs> things that he was talking about that you know, are, are, are deep scientific questions for science that are unresolved. And there are things like the ultimate nature of matter and force, the origin of life, the origin of motion, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing for us here is what he said of a few of them. So he highlighted a few of them, and of those, he said, ignoramus et ignorabimus. 
Now, ignoramus in Latin, right, says, means we don't know. Now, that's a very common thing for a scientist. There's lots of things we don't know. <coughs> that's fine. <laughs> ignorabimus, that's the controversial one. Ignorabimus means we will not know, we shall not know. So what he was saying of these things is not only, it's not only the case that science doesn't know about them now, <laughs> science will never know about it. Right? These are things that we can never find an answer for. So even though we might think of them as precise questions, scientific questions, philosophical questions, however you want to think of them, they are ones that are never going to be answered. So that was a current of thought, but it was by certainly not a universally accepted one. There was certainly opposition from the other side, and a very famous figure on the other side was David Hilbert. Hilbert was a truly great mathematician. Uh, his influence over mathematics is, is extremely widespread. Some people have said that he was maybe the last person to know all of the mathematics of his time. I don't know, but he certainly knew a lot of it and was influential in a lot of it. And he was very interested in the foundations of mathematics, in uh, the, the philosophy of mathematics and, and so on. And, in, and he had a very particular worldview. And in 1930, uh, he gave a, a speech to the Society of German Scientists and Physicians. It was broadcast on the radio. You can go online if you want and listen to him deliver it, though it'll be in German. <coughs> and the most famous, probably, paragraph <coughs> in his speech is the one where he says this. <coughs> we must not believe those who today, with philosophical bearing and deliberative tone, prophesy the fall of culture and accept the ignorabimus. For us, there is no ignorabimus, <coughs> and in my opinion, none whatever in natural science. In opposition to the foolish ignorabimus, our slogan shall be, we must know, we will know. Wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. That was his slogan. And that was a conviction that he carried quite literally to his grave. This, this is Hilbert's gravestone. And it's hard to see, but it says, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. So that's actually written on his grave. Um, so that was an important slogan in his life. He was speaking as a mathematician, of course. Um, so at least my take at it, I don't know, is that when he says that for us, there is no grammar. This is, he means there's no in mathematics. And then he goes further. He says, in my opinion, none whatever in natural science. Now, of course, maybe the in my opinion is a slight qualification there. <laughs> the way I take it is that in mathematics, he thinks it's just a fact. And maybe in science, it's just his opinion. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> certainly in mathematics, I think he believed that this is not the case. Any well-posed mathematical question is going to have an answer. And furthermore, we're going to find that answer. It might take us 100 years. It might take us 1,000. But we're going to find that answer. So it's a very positive way of thinking. On the other hand, for mathematics anyway, <coughs> at that time, <coughs> the late 19th and early 20th century was a very reasonable position, I think. So I said that Leibniz's dream was somehow maybe something that had fallen out of fashion in, in most areas. But in mathematics, it was very much alive. And it made sense for it to be alive. Because mathematics, unlike <coughs> maybe philosophy and art and so forth, seems like an eminently formalizable thing. This idea of uh, Leibniz that one can come up with a formal language, a formal conceptual language, is not alien at all to mathematics. And we all know that, right? I mean, when you do math <coughs> in class, you, don't <coughs> you may think things in natural language, but at some point, you're writing these weird symbols, right? These x squareds and integral symbols and so on and so forth that are not natural language. They're precise um, objects that are supposed to have <coughs> an independent meaning and a very precise one. And when we reason about mathematics, we tend to have you know, very, uh, um, at least in principle, <laughs> formalizable methods of reasoning, of what counts as correct reasoning in mathematics. Uh, so let me get back to that in a second. Uh, but let me say one thing first about this business of generating the truth, and possibly generating the truth mechanically. It's not hard at all to generate the whole truth, as long as you also allow me to generate everything that's not true. Right? If you ask me whether it's raining outside, I can say, yes, it is. No, it isn't. I told you the truth. I've also told you a lie, but that's besides the point. Right? So there's a, a, a representation of that, very famous one, in uh, the work of Jorge Luis Borges, a wonderful Argentinian writer. If you haven't read him, go and find his work there, especially if you like mathematics and philosophy and so forth. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, and he has this, this short story called The Library of Babel, uh, in which he describes a library that essentially contains all possible books. So it has all possible, you know, all books, all possible combinations of symbols in some particular language. So of course, most of the books are nonsense, right? They're just symbols that make no sense. But every possible book, including the ones that make a lot of sense, are there. And as the narrator says at some point, 
What's there? Well, everything. <coughs> the minutely detailed history of the future, the archangel's autobiographies, the faithful catalogs of the library, thousands and thousands of false catalogs, the demonstration of the fallacy of those catalogs, the demonstration of the fallacy of the true catalogs, everything. Right? So the whole truth is there, but there's no way you, for you to pick it out from all of the other false stuff. So it doesn't help you a lot. So we don't want just the whole truth. We also want nothing but the truth. Right? I'll come back to these guys in a second. Now let me say something about formal systems. So as I said, mathematics seems like the natural home for Leibniz's dream because it seems the natural home for formalization. And in fact, this was happening in the late 19th to early 20th century. People were coming up with formal systems for mathematics for various uh, reasons, uh, which <coughs> I won't necessarily go into <coughs> now, but there's a lot of uh, good reasons to do so. Um, and the idea of a formal system is that one wants to define a language for mathematics. So let's go back to Leibniz's term of a characteristic of universalis, but we're doing it now for mathematics. We're defining a language for mathematics. Uh, and again, this is not an unusual concept for those of us who might sit in the classroom and have people draw symbols on the board. <laughs> then we want to choose axioms and rules of inference. That corresponds to Leibniz's idea of the calculus retrospector. So an axiom is just a statement that we're going to take as true. And a rule of inference is a way of transforming things we have already agreed are true into further things that will, that will still be true. And then the idea is that we start from the axioms, and by applying the rules, we can get more and more and more statements. And all of them are going to be valid, true, because we started from true things, and we're applying methods of reasoning that we believe are valid. So let me give an example of the kind of thing we might be talking about. Here's a sample axiom we might to, want to adopt. So I think all of these symbols here, the you know, plus sign and, and, and equal sign, whatever is familiar to people. <coughs> The one that might be unfamiliar to some people is the upside down A, and that is just supposed to mean for all, for every, right? So this here says for every x and for every y, x plus y is equal to y plus x. So that's just the statement that addition is commutative. If you add two numbers this way or that way, you get the same answer. So that's a sample axiom that hopefully people believe is true for the usual addition and numbers that we're used to. And here's a sample rule that hopefully people also agree is a good one. For any number n, if I already know that for every x some statement phi of x holds, <coughs> then I can conclude that phi of n holds. Right? So if, so if I've told you this is true for every number, and I ask you, is it true of 7? You say, yes, it's true of every number. Although, is it true of 13? Yes, it's true of every number, right? and so on. So now, wh what's the deduction look like? <coughs> well, we might, for example, start from our axiom. <coughs> for all x, for all y, x plus y is equal to y plus x. And then this rule allows us to substitute our x by 2. So now we have for all y, 2 plus y is equal to y plus 2. But now we, we have another for all, so our rule allows us to do another substitution. And now we substitute y by 3. So now you get 2 plus 3 equals to 3 plus 2. OK, great. right? But that follows, and follows by deduction. And of course, instead of 2 and 3, I could use 5 and 17 or whatever. So from the single axiom and the single rule, I get infinitely many true statements. Right? So there's a good general power. Of course, it's a toy example, right? But you can <coughs> do something uh, a lot more complicated with this. And two people who did do something a lot more complicated with this uh, were Russell and Whitehead um, in this multi-volume huge book called The Principia Mathematica, in which they um, attempted to develop a formal system where you could deduce essentially all of mathematics from first principles in this kind of way. So here's an example, a famous example of a proposition from Principia. And it's got a bunch of symbols here. So you can see that this is not lateral language, right? This is, formal, this is a formal language. <coughs> but the interesting bit about, well, <coughs> there's two interesting bits about this proposition. One of them is that it's number 54.43. So as you might imagine, it comes pretty late in the book. <coughs> Second, you might not be able to read this. But what it says in the bottom here is, from this proposition, it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So it takes them about 200 or 300 pages to get to 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's what it means to start from first principles and derive things. right? But the idea is that you can do that systematically and derive all mathematics. And of course, if you can do this, I mean, they were doing this in 1910, 1913, so this might not have been in their minds at that time. But nowadays, I think it's very natural for us to see, well, if you can do this, a computer should be able to do this even better. right? It's the kind of thing that computers are good at, applying rules to other rules and doing it systematically. OK, so the Principia Mathematica was an important uh, bit of work. I mean, these are people, Russell uh, was important in many other ways. He was a philosopher, uh, uh, a political activist, won the Nobel Prize for Literature and so forth. But this is his work as a logician. Um, so this all seemed really good, right? This seemed to really play into this Hilbertian idea that we, that, uh, you know, 
and into Leibniz's dream for mathematics anyway, that we should be able to know everything. Uh, and we should be able to know everything in this very formal, uh, maybe even mechanizable way by just starting with some actions, applying some rules, and so forth. However, in 1931, uh, Kurt Gödel, Austrian um, mathematician, one, one of the most important figures of, well, say, logic, but, but in general, the intellectual history of the 20th century, uh, <laughs> published this, this paper uh, on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems. And what he did there is, is prove what is now a very famous theorem known as Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. And even though Principia Mathematica was in the title, the, um, the theorem that he proved was very general. It wasn't about Principia itself. Principia was in the title just because that was the famous system that was out there. But this is something that was meant to apply <coughs> very more generally, much more generally. Uh, and what he, what he proved was this. Suppose that you have any Reasonable, reasonably powerful formal system T. Now, this is me being precise. This was not good at being precise. In, in his theorem, the conditions for what I mean by reasonable and reasonably and reasonably powerful are absolutely precise. Here, I don't want to get into that, but just think of reasonable as, well, <coughs> for example, you don't want to think of a formal system that says something is true and also says it's false at the same time, right? That would be a very bad idea. That wouldn't be very good for mathematics. And reasonably powerful just means reasonable enough to do basic mathematics. As long as you can do the basics of, of arithmetic, that's powerful enough. So anything uh, where you can really formalize a lot of mathematics. So for any such formal system, there's going to be a statement in that language that the system neither proves nor disproves. So that means that if we start from our axioms, however we choose our axioms, if we start from axioms and follow our rules, however we choose our rules, there's still going to be some things where we're neither going to be able to say this is true nor be able to say this is false by applying those rules to the axioms. So there's no way to get the whole truth by this formal way. Um, sorry, yeah, so you can get nothing but the truth, but you can't get the whole truth. So that was a real blow, of course, to this kind of Hilbertian viewpoint, however, there are very powerful formal systems. So, you know, you've got a kind of good news, bad news, good news, right? So maybe Gödel's theorem is bad news, but on the other hand, <coughs> we can get formal systems that encompass all of the principles of mathematical reasoning that mathematicians use. And this was, in fact, done in the 19th, into the 20th century in the development of, of, of formal set theory. So the point is that there are certain methods, certain rules that mathematicians <coughs> believe in. <coughs> certain axes, we can collect all of those and try to collect them in a reasonably compact formal system and work with that. And then that system should be about, you know, at least as powerful as the mathematical community, right? Anything that I can prove, the system should be able to prove as well. And if we then kind of give up, say, okay, so maybe we're not going to get the whole truth, but we're going to get a lot of it, right? A lot of things that the system is going to be able to prove or disprove. We still might be very interested in the question of whether we can do that mechanically. And Hilbert certainly was. So in 1928, this book came out, uh, The Principles of Theoretical, of Mathematical Logic, I guess would be the way we'd say it these days, days. It was a collection of lecture notes by Hilbert that was organized by uh, Willem Ackerman, who was a student at the time. Uh, <coughs> became probably best known these days by something called the Ackerman function. If you don't know what it is, look it up. It's kind of cool. A very, very fast growing function. Um, and uh, in that, they, they um, presented this thing called the Entscheidungsproblem. That's just fancy German for the decision problem. And what the Entscheidungsproblem was, 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 was this. It was to find an algorithm for determining, given a formal system in a statement, whether that statement is provable in the system. So let's unpack this for a second. Uh, so, well, first of all, well, the next thing I'm going to get to is what, this, what, what we mean by an algorithm. But think of it as just a procedure. <laughs> A mechanical procedure. Here's an example of an algorithm. Addition, right? You know how you, you know, you're given two numbers, you put one on top of the other, and then you, you, know, you take the two numbers, and if there's a carry, you carry the bit, and so forth. And that's something that you, you teach people. You can go and teach a kid how to do that, and that sort of thing. That's an algorithm, right? That's a procedure that you follow. It has particular rules, um, and so on. Uh, so the idea would be to find an algorithm, a set of rules, where if you give them somehow a formal system and a statement, it tells you whether that system is provable or not. And in particular, of course, the really interesting thing is if you take this T to be a very powerful system, like one that encompasses all of, of our accepted mathematical reasoning, <laughs> and then take sigma to be a significant mathematical statement. So the way nowadays that we proceed is <laughs> a whole bunch of us 
sit in our offices with you know pencil and paper and boards, and most of the time we go no, you know, and you go oh no, that doesn't work, you know, and you do that for about a hundred years, and you get a theorem, right? You know, the several hundreds of mathematicians doing it over several hundreds of years, and you get some theorems. And the idea here is, can we find a procedure where all I have to do is I have to say here's my favorite statement, right? Is it is it going to be provable? And the thing would run for a while and say yes, it is. Great, now, I'm, now I, I, don't, I don't need to pay all these mathematicians, right? I know. And if it says no, it isn't, then you can look at the negation of the statement and see if that's provable, right? So somehow this might be a way of trying to get mathematicians out of business. But um, the other thing that's important to say about this is that <coughs> this problem was stated in this very positive Herbertian mode, find an algorithm, right? He never had any doubt that there was going to be one. And you can really, really think this as the expression of Leibniz's dream in mathematics, right? So this, was, this is kind of, <coughs> in light of Gödel's theorem, I guess the best you can do. <coughs> Define an algorithm that will figure out uh, uh, <coughs> maybe not everything, whether everything is true, but at least of the things that are provable by mathematics, right? Whether they're true. And then there's a philosophical question, the things that are neither provable nor disprovable by our current mathematical methods, are those things really either true or false? But I'm not going to get into that. But at least this would be a really reasonable realization of Leibniz's dream. Uh, in the mathematical context. <coughs> okay, now, <coughs> you might see where I'm going here. When I made such a, a kind of fuss of the fact that Hilbert was being very positive and saying, find an algorithm, right? That I want to talk about the possibility that there may not be one. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to find an algorithm, <coughs> okay, you go and you find it and you tell me why it works and hopefully I believe you and everything's fine. If I want to prove to you that there is no algorithm, then I really need a definition of algorithm, right? I need to tell you what an algorithm is if I'm going to tell you there isn't any of those, right? <coughs> so let's say a little bit about algorithms. So the word algorithm comes out of uh, the name of Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, very important mathematician who wrote, who wrote very, two very, very influential books, uh, Persian mathematician, who's also a, an astronomer and a geographer. And he wrote, he wrote a book that, um, that was very influential in development of algebra uh, in the Arab world and in, in, in Europe. And, and this word in the title Al-Jabr, translated into algebra in, um, in uh, Latin, <coughs> gives us the modern word algebra. And then he wrote this other book that introduced to the Arab world and to uh, Europe the use of numbers coming from India, which is the number system that we now use, right? The Arab Indic numbers. Uh, and in and of course, algorithms, you know, procedures were central to that, right? How do you add numbers? How do you multiply numbers? And so on. <coughs> and in Latin, this was often, the book was called Algorithmici de Numerum Dorum, which just means algorithmi was just their weird way of writing Alcorismi, right? So this just means Alcorismi's book about Indian numbers. And from that word, from that word, <coughs> from his name, the word algorithm was born. So he did really well in getting things named after him in his books. Um, so that's where the word algorithm comes from. Now, as I said, we're all familiar with algorithms. And if some of you, you know, <coughs> either now or at some point might learn about something like the Euclidean algorithm for finding the prime divisors of a number. So, all, you know, there's lots of algorithms that one learns in mathematics. Here's a, a less mathematical, more practical type of, of algorithm. This is how to tie a half Windsor knot. And, you know, there's a bunch of instructions here. And if you follow the instructions, I know from personal experience, even someone who's very uncoordinated like myself can actually tie a tie just by following those, those rules. <coughs> but, what is an algorithm, right? <laughs> what do we actually mean? We have an intuitive notion. It's a set of procedures that a person, or maybe these days you'd say a computer, can follow and so forth. But formal definitions of algorithms, well, that's more complicated. And there were several people who attempted to give formalizations of the notion of algorithms, so a precise mathematical definition of what an algorithm is. And a lot of that happened in the 1930s. Several formalizations of the notion of uh, algorithm uh, were introduced. As it turns out, all of them were provably equivalent. They're actually the same definition, but that wasn't necessarily obvious at the, <clears throat> when they were first developed. So there's a lot of people involved in this. Um, Alonzo Church uh, and um, <coughs> Stephen Cleaney and Emil Post in, in the US and Gödel himself. Uh, <coughs> and uh, also uh, Rosa Peter in, uh, in Hungary. And Jacques Herbrand, who's a French mathematician, who was, by all accounts, a very brilliant mathematician who died tragically young in a mountain climbing accident when he was just 23, but still managed to do a great amount of work. Uh, and they came up with various uh, formalizations. And in fact, Church, 
gave a negative solution to the enchantment problem using his definition. So he said, look, if by algorithm you mean what I mean, then I can prove that there is no algorithm for the enchantment problem. And I'll talk in a second how one might prove this kind of thing in a different context, but he did that. The problem is this. Was this definition, even once we know that they're all the same, so once you know that they're all the same, you get at least some feeling maybe that's a reasonable definition of something, but is it the definition of algorithm, right? And the problem is that you might look at the definition, you might say, okay, every algorithm I can think of fits your definition, <laughs> but how do I know that tomorrow somebody's not gonna come up with a really, really clever thing that all of us will say, oh yeah, we agree that this is a, an algorithm, a well-defined procedure, and yet it doesn't fit the definition. Right? <laughs> and if we're not sure of that, then we can just say this is provisionally our definition of algorithm, but not necessarily a definition. In fact, I think people at that time thought that maybe this was going to go on forever, that we were never going to have a definition that we could really be comfortable with as the definition of, of algorithm. Certainly Gödel famously was, even though he had come up with definition, <laughs> himself not very convinced that we had actually you know, gotten, or they had actually gotten the, the right definition. That's where Turing comes into the picture. So in 1936, uh, publi Turing published this paper called Uncomputable Numbers with an Application to the Enchidence Problem. And what he did there is he actually started from first principles. He gave an analysis of the idea of algorithm. He said, well, what, do we, what, what are the necessary components of an algorithm? So he said, well, it's things like, <laughs> They should be given by a set of instructions, but that set of instructions should be finite, and it should be written in some kind of finite alphabet. Doesn't matter which, right? Doesn't matter what language you write it, but you can't have an infinite set of instructions. That doesn't count. <coughs> the algorithm should proceed in discrete steps. It should be deterministic. You shouldn't at some point have to make a choice. It doesn't count as an algorithm. There's, um, there's this famous like 20 steps. So the Riemann hypothesis is a very <coughs> important problem in mathematics, and there's a 20 step program to for proving the Riemann hypothesis, count until 19 and then prove the Riemann hypothesis. That doesn't count as an algorithm, right? Um, so, you know, so he gave these kind of rules, a very careful philosophical analysis of what we meant by an algorithm. I'm not gonna go through it, I don't have time, but Turing's paper is actually quite readable. It's not a sort of <laughs> dense mathematical paper where you need a lot of background. This philosophical part of the argument you can really follow, so, and it is available online and it is a very interesting thing to read. Um, but then what he did from this analysis is he gave a definition based on this analysis. Based on his analysis, he gave a machine model of computation known as a Turing machine. So this was a precise mathematical definition, but it can be visualized as a particular kind of machine that has a tape, <coughs> and the machine can write on the tape and read on the tape, move right and left, you know, kind of things like that. But it, there's a precise definition, which I'm not going to give. Um, but he, based on his analysis, he argued that any kind of algorithm implemented by any kind of human or machine uh, could be simulated by a Turing machine, and therefore <laughs> Turing machines could be thought of as computing anything that can be computed. And that was a very persuasive argument. Now using that, we can then define, let's say a function, right? Just think of a function that takes numbers and spits out numbers, for example, but any kind of function. Uh, is Turing computable, or just computable, <laughs> If there is a Turing machine that when you start the machine, you give the machine, so it doesn't matter if you know what a Turing machine is, you can think of one of a you know, modern day computer, right? You can run some kind of program, you give it a number, it does some kind of computation and spits out another number, right? <laughs> so if there is a machine that on input n outputs f of n. So with a modern computer, for example, anyone who's done some kind of, if you've done any kind of program, you know you can write a program to, I don't know, if I give you n, the program is going to return me n squared or n factorial or whatever it is, right? Those are easy programs to write. So those, those would count as computable. So that's what <coughs> the definition of computable uh, using Turing's machine is. As it turns out, this notion is also equivalent to all the other notions that, that we had before, churches and all those. So, you know, that's actually good evidence that it's, that it's that's nice. And it is true then <coughs> that the people who were looking for a definition before, in some sense, got something right. But what was there in Turing's work that wasn't there in their work was this philosophical analysis of algorithm that was convincing to people, including, for example, to Gödel, that this was the right definition. And so we end up with something called the Church-Turing thesis, uh, has, goes by various names, but that's one name, uh, that this notion of computable, which is a precise mathematical notion, <coughs> is equal to the intuitive notion of something that can be done by algorithm. This is not a mathematical theorem, right? I mean, it can't be because on the one side it has a mathematical 
<laughs> precise mathematical entity, and the other has, it has an intuitive entity, right? So there's no way that's a, a theorem, but it is a philosophical thesis and one that has been pretty widely uh, accepted. Okay, so <laughs> what did Turing do with his notion? Well, he did a lot of cool things, but one thing that he did was to attack the enchantments problem. Now here's the thing. This is, this is one, there's lots of things about the work of Turing and other pioneers of computability theory that have become a lot easier to explain now than they would have been, I don't know, you know, 50 years ago or something like that, because we all have experience with computers these days, right? Even if it's just the ones in your pocket. And, and one of the things that I think everyone has an experience with is trying to do something in a computer and have the computer hang. Right, you're trying to load a web page, you're trying to do something, and you got some little symbol that says, I'm working on it, and I'm working on it, I'm working. And at some point you have to decide, do I turn off the computer, do I hit some reset, or is it just about to conclude its operation? <coughs> and often you don't know, right? And that's sometimes a very bad thing, right? <laughs> it's bad enough when I'm trying to load a web page. If you're trying to design, say, a self-driving car, and the car has to make a decision, it's about to hit a wall, whether to go right, left, or break, and it gets into an infinite loop and never makes a decision, that's a very bad thing, right? So it would be very, very nice if we had some mechanical way to know whether a program is going to be tro thrown into an infinite loop before that happens, right? So that leads to the notion of the halting problem that Turing came up with. So the halting problem is this. Given a Turing machine M and an input N, <laughs> Does M halt an input N? That is, if I feed N as the input and the machine runs for a while, is it going to give me an answer, or is it just going to go on forever? This would be a very nice thing to know. And, but then, what Turing proved is that the halting problem is not computable. There is no algorithm for deciding the halting problem. Now, I'm not going to give you the proof, but I'll tell you that, the, that one thing that's essential here is that notice that this notion of computable is itself defined using Turing machines, right? It was in the previous slide. So, <laughs> To say that the halting problem is not computable is to say that there is no Turing machine such that if you hand it as an input, another Turing machine in N, it decides whether that machine halts an N. So there's some kind of self-reference of machines thinking about machines, and that's what allows this theorem to be proved. It's actually not, not a, a difficult proof. You can probably look it up in Wikipedia or something like that once you understand the basics of, of Turing machines. But it is a very, very powerful idea. And it has an application to the Enchantments problem. Why? Well. Remember that I said that there's these very powerful formal systems, right? There are formal systems that encode <coughs> all of our mathematical methods. The definition of Turing machine that, that, that uh, Turing gave is actually a pretty simple mathematical definition as these things go. So it's certainly itself encodable in a formal system. In that formal system, you can write <coughs> formal versions of the statement, this machine halts on this input. And then if the machine does halt, the system is going to prove that it does. And if it doesn't, it's not. So that means that if we could solve the enchantments problem, then we would have an algorithm for deciding the halting problem. Because if I want to know whether the machine M halts on N, <coughs> I just ask, is the statement that M halts on N provable? And then I'll know. So this is an example of what's called a reduction. I've reduced the halting problem to the enchantments problem. <coughs> Any solution for the enchantments problem, in particular, gives you a solution for the halting problem. And one thing about reduction is, what, if you've reduced the halting problem to the enchantments problem, you've, you've said that the halting problem is no harder than the enchantments problem. However, the halting problem is not computable, so there's no way the enchantments problem can be, right? If the easier problem can't be done, then you certainly can't do the harder problem. So this was Turing's way of proving that <coughs> Hilbert was wrong. In a, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, can someone be wrong when asking a question, right? But in some sense, he was, right? Because the question, the question said, give an algorithm. And the answer is, there is no algorithm, right? So that's, <laughs> that, that shows that somehow that, that kind of worldview was, was not correct. And so in some sense, you could say, so remember that I said that uh, the mathematics was the natural home for um, Leibniz's dream, exactly because it is such a formalizable subject and so forth. But we all know that most accidents happen in the home, right? And <laughs> The very fact that mathematics is formalizable was what allowed Church and Turing to show not just kind of that Leibniz's dream looks kind of implausible or that it might not work, but that in this very precise form, it simply does not work provably, does not work. Uh, which you know, I think is a very cool resolution <laughs> to the situation, um, at least, you know, at least a partial resolution. I'll get to a last slide where I talk, well, I'll say a little bit more about ways in which Leibniz's dream is still very much alive. But in, but in this way, the, 
the kind of precise formulation embodying the Entscheidungs problem is just not going to happen. So where do we go from this, right? So this seems like a very negative result, but it actually isn't. It's actually a very, very positive one in the sense that a lot of great mathematics has come out of these ideas. So one thing to notice here is that Turing, who was a very smart guy, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, no, that, that, wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't my intent, but yes. No, this was the smiling Turing because he proved the theorem here. Uh, so, um, no, the thing I wanted to point out <laughs> is that he did not name his paper a solution to the Entscheidungs problem or something like that. He named his paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem, right? So the idea here is that this application is cool and all, but the development of this notion, that's the important thing. And that has led to a lot of things. One thing that it has led to is the ability to show that various other things also can't be done algorithmically, which is good to know. You might say it's a negative thing. <laughs> you might also say it's a very positive thing if, you're trying, if you were about to spend your entire career trying to look for an algorithm, right? And then somebody can show you there isn't one. So here's an example. So in 1900, Hilbert gave an address to the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris where he talked about these problems for the future century. And they were all very, you know, very influential problems in the development of mathematics since then. His tenth problem had to do with Diophantine equations, which are named after the Greek mathematician Diophantus. A Diophantine equation uh, is a polynomial equation with integer coefficients whose solutions must be integers. So what do we mean? Well, it's one of those polynomials, right? It's got many variables. <coughs> so here's an example. I have 3x times y times z minus 8y squared z, and et cetera, right? So you just write this thing, and then you ask, does this have a solution? But I only, for a solution, <coughs> I only allow integer values for x, y, and z. So it would be okay for x to be 7 or minus 13. It would be not be okay for x to be a half or square root of 2 or pi. Right? So does this particular equation, for example, have a solution? I have absolutely no idea because I picked this one out at random. Right? So I don't know whether this one does. But there are, there are Diophantine equations that do have solutions. For example, if you pick x equals 2, y equals 3, and z equals 4 here, that, that's going to work because right? they add up to 29. On the other hand, this very similar looking one here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 29 rather than minus 29, doesn't have a solution because <coughs> x squared, y squared, and z squared are always not negative, right? A squared number can't be negative. So when you add all three, the least you're going to get is 0. And then you add 29, there's no way you're going to get back to 0, right? So that one, OK, easily doesn't have a solution. But what about this question? So this was Hilbert's 10th problem. Find an algorithm for determining whether a given Diophantine equation has a solution. So come up with a, let's say, computer program, you'd say these days, that I could feed the program this monster here, and it would run for a while, and it would say, yes, there is a solution. Maybe even give me a solution, I don't know, but at least say yes. Or maybe say, no, there is no solution. <laughs> of course, again, Hilbert, right? Find an algorithm, not is there an algorithm, right? Well, there was. <laughs> Significant work on this problem, uh, in particular by Martin Davis and Hilary Putnam, Julia Robinson, and Yuri Matsisevich, who finished it off. So this was all work building, various people building on other people's work. And finally, they proved this thing that is now known as the DPRM theorem after their initials. <coughs> there is no algorithm for deciding whether a given Diophantine equation has a solution. So just like the Enchidas problem, you can't do this one. And that's Rather fascinating, in fact, because there's the problem of understanding the solutions of Diophantine equations. You know, there's lots of interesting mathematics there. Uh, there is, for example, a, a related question. So the, the Clay Mathematical Institute, which is this mathematical <coughs> institute with quite a bit of money, uh, in 2000, they, they selected seven problems as the uh, millennium problems, and they put a million dollars on each of them. So if you solve that problem, you get a million dollars. And one of them, <coughs> the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, has, you know, is related to this idea of finding, of understanding the solutions of a small, special class of Diophantine equations, right? Uh, and that's already an incredibly important problem. So it really is very interesting that the general problem just can't be done by any algorithmic means. So that's one thing that happens. Another thing was the development of this field of computability theory, which is the field I work in. So I, you know, I think this is a very important development as well. Uh, in particular, Turing's idea led to the notions of relative computability. And I'm putting Emile Post's picture back up here, because even though Turing did come up with this idea, it was really Post who worked it out to <coughs> a point where we saw that there were some interesting, very interesting mathematics coming out of that. So what's the idea here? 
Another one of those things that's much easier to explain these days than it would have been in the past. No matter how powerful computers are, you can make them more powerful by connecting them to other stuff outside, right? So suppose that I say, oh, I've got this great program for predicting the future performance of the stock market based on the past performance. <coughs> Let's say that my program actually works, right? <coughs> Even then, my program is completely useless if I don't actually have the, the data on the past performance of the market, right? I can't do anything. So for the program to actually be able to do anything, it needs access to this extra data. Maybe I just connect it to the internet, right, and download that data. So we all know that a, a, a computer connected to the internet can do things that a computer not connected to the internet can't. So that's exactly the idea of what's called a Turing machine with Oracle. The idea of a computer <laughs> that has access to some information. Let's say that it has access to information about an object A, <laughs> and then it uses that to compute an object B. Right? That is the idea of B being computable from A. And maybe there would be no way to do it without A. So for example, the halting problem, the Enchidens problem, and Hilbert's 10 problem are all computably equivalent in the sense that if I provide you a solution to the halting problem as an oracle, <coughs> then you can actually solve the Enchidens problem and vice versa. And same thing for Hilbert's 10 problem. So all three of them are the same from the, in this precise uh, way that is um, defined in, in computability theory. And this idea that <coughs> if you have a machine with access to one of these problems, it can also solve the other one. And there's a lot that we can do with this. So computability theory studies these ideas and lots of applications. Uh, for example, to the study of the computable content of mathematics. So um, there's lots of things that one learns in mathematics uh, that one might wonder about the effect of content. I mean, Hilbert's time problem is obviously one, right? One thing like that. But think about something like this, uh, which, well, you know, some of you <laughs> may have seen this, this <laughs> fact that some of you may later, uh, that if you have a continuous function on, let's say, the unit interval 0, 1, then that function is going to have a maximum value somewhere there. Then you might ask, OK, how hard uh, can we compute the maximum value somehow if the function is nice enough? <coughs> if we can compute it, how difficult is it to compute it? Like, is it as bad as the halting problem? Is it not as bad as the halting problem? So those are the kind of questions that effective mathematics, the study of the computable content of mathematics, uh, can study. Uh, and that ends up connecting very deeply with certain foundational issues <coughs> arising out of Gödel's work and, and so forth. I won't get into that. Uh, another, just another example, I mean, particularly since <coughs> uh, CT mentioned in my book with Rod on, on algorithmic randomness, one thing that computability is really good for is, is that it allows us to give a definition of randomness for individual objects. Like if you want to say, uh, <coughs> what is it that if I flip a coin and produce a sequence that way, that looks random, but the sequence 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 doesn't, right? And how do you actually mathematically capture the distinction between the two and so on? So there's lots of other things, but computability theory is now a very well-developed uh, <coughs> field. We've had, you know, currently having three weeks of computability theory and program, uh, the IMS, and, you know, there's a lot to say about it. So that was a very productive thing that came out of Turing's work. Another thing, of course, is complexity theory. So one thing that I haven't mentioned at all is this idea of efficiency of algorithms, because that wasn't necessarily very much in the radar back in the day when people were first thinking about algorithms, right? But here's the thing. Some algorithms may take a very long time. If I tell you, if you have a problem and I say, yes, I can write a computer program to solve it. Now, of course, it's going to take longer than the age of the universe running in the fastest possible computer to solve your problem. You're going to say, you haven't really solved my problem, right? So it's interesting to figure out how fast <coughs> algorithms may run, or how much memory they may need, things like that. And um, an example of, of the kind of questions one might ask about this is, so this theory of complexity, there's this paper by Hartmanis and, and Stearns that started the, uh, the kind of modern theory of it, although there are, there's people like Goodle and so forth who are already thinking about it. Uh, now, there's a class of problems that's known as P for polynomial time. And very vaguely, let me define it as problems where finding a solution is relatively easy. So you might think that those are ones you can actually perform on a computer. And then there's a different class of problems called MP, which you can think of as problems where verifying a solution is relatively easy. So here's the difference between those two things. You go to, say, like a big concert. There's like 10,000 people there. And maybe your brother came or didn't come to the concert, right? And I go and I ask you. Um, is your brother here, right? Well, there's all of these people to 
look at, right? The only thing you can really do is try to go and look at each person and see, right? That's very, very difficult. However, if I point to someone and say, isn't that your brother? Probably you're going to be able to say yes or no, right? So it's very easy to verify my attempt at a solution, right? It's very hard to find the solution. So there's examples like that. And the thing is that there's a lot of problems, very interesting problems, that live in this class NP. In particular, ones that are known as NP complete, which are ones that are as difficult as any other problem in NP. If we could solve them, we could prove other problems in NP. And there's some very uh, important ones. In fact, ones that are, <laughs> there's problems in NP that are used for things like you know, protecting your bank account, the cryptographic protocols, and things like that. So uh, Stephen Cook and Leonid Levin um, independently came up with the, in these you know, proof that certain problems were, were MP complete. And <coughs> we think that those problems are not NP, right? We think that there are these problems that are somehow um, harder than this polynomial time class, but we don't know for sure. So another one of the Clay Millennium problems, <laughs> which again, you can get a million dollars to prove, but if you actually were able to solve this problem, the million dollars would be the least thing you'd get, uh, is whether P is equal to NP. And in fact, at, at IMS, you can buy a mug with this written on it. Uh, <laughs> and that problem is completely open. It's a very basic problem. It's very, if I wanted to state it precisely, I don't have time here, but if I took 10 minutes, I could even state it completely precisely. <laughs> And yet, you know, many, many people have worked on it, but it's still riddle. So there's still a lot to know about this. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the title of this was Waking Up for Life says Dream. But when you wake up for a dream, that doesn't mean the dream is dead, right? Sometimes you just have to kind of square it away with reality a little bit. There are a lot of things <coughs> going on that can be seen as realizations of Leibniz's dream in a very positive way. <coughs> Expert systems are one. I don't know if any of you have used something like WebMD, right? <coughs> You go online, you have some symptoms, you have a headache, whatever, you know, you, you kind of go on WebMD and it runs for a while and it says, well, either you have a cold or you have cancer, right? One of the two, right? <laughs> Consult your doctor. But anyway, there's these expert systems, right, that, that can use knowledge to automatically generate answers. There's a whole field of artificial intelligence, automated reasoning that tries to <coughs> do maybe a more sophisticated version of that. In particular, in mathematics, there's the idea of automated theorem proving, of trying to give <coughs> the computer some heuristics so that the computer can act like a mathematician and find new theorems and so forth. We know we're not going to get you know, the, whole, the kind of whole truth, nothing but the truth kind of thing, but we at least can get some truth, maybe, automatically. And one that I find very interesting that has been growing a lot of steam recently is automated proof verification. The idea there is to use computer systems to help you give formal verifications of proofs where the proofs originally might be written in, say, human language, you know, something. <coughs> And, but you want to formalize them so that you can actually have a greater certainty of the proof. And this can actually become quite important. Thomas Hales uh, proved something called the Kepler conjecture. Uh, <coughs> very easy to understand <coughs> uh, statement. Uh, you know when you want to pack oranges? There's a usual way that oranges get packed, right? The way you put one on top of the other. And the question is, is that the most efficient way? Is that the way where, where you have most space taken up by oranges, right? And Kepler's conjecture is that, yes, it is. Uh, and, but that turned out to take several hundred years <coughs> to be proved, and, and, and Thomas Hales finally proved it. He submitted this paper. The, 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 the paper does, use, it does also use computer, uh, some computer work for, some of the, for the cases of the problem, et cetera, but incredibly complicated paper. Eventually, he got something back from the journal saying, look, <coughs> this is great. We're 99% sure your proof is correct, but we just have run out of human steam to verify that your proof is correct. So he got annoyed by that, and he started this thing called the Flyspec Project to verify this particular proof formally using methods that were already available uh, <coughs> and new things. And this has actually succeeded, and they actually have like a formal verification of the Kepler conjecture. So that, that kind of thing is very exciting, I think, for the future of mathematics. And of course, it's made possible by a mathematical version of Leibniz's dream, this idea of formalizing something and then being able to use automated or partially automated methods by a calculus of reasoning uh, to come up with conclusions. So, you know, yeah, we've had to kind of adjust the dream, but, but there's still some uh, great uh, things coming out of it. And I will leave it at that, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>